Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Suchit Anand and I'm from the Global Open Data for Agriculture and Nutrition. On behalf of Godan, uh, I would like to welcome you all to our webinar series. Uh, so we are very happy to have uh, today a presentation from the Land Portal Foundation. In fact, Land Portal Foundation gave a presentation before as well on, on uh, the Vital Land Portal Initiative, but today's webinar is uh, more focused on uh, more details uh, on the uh, open data standards and uh, training and all, all aspects of it. So we would like to, I'm very happy to welcome uh, Lissati May, uh, who is uh, working for the Land Portal Foundation. And she will be uh, talking more about uh, what Land Portal Foundation is doing and uh, more on the standards uh, and other aspects of, uh, of Land Portal's work. So Lissati May, uh, is a, uh, her background is a, she's a lawyer and she has been working in Land Portal Foundation for over four years and she's leading these efforts at the Land Portal Foundation. So without further ado, I would like to uh, hand over to Lisette who will, uh, who will explain more uh, on this presentation. And uh, for all attendees, uh, I would like to welcome you all and request you to send your questions uh, through the chat window. We have a chat window uh, you can see on the screen. So please feel free to send any questions you have through the chat window. And once the webinar is finished, we will go through your questions and Lisette will be happy to answer these questions. So I want to uh, hand it over now to Lisette to uh, uh, go through the presentation. So thank you, uh, thank you everyone. And thank you Lisette for joining us today. Thank you, Suchis. Um, can can you hear me? I hope you can hear me. Um, hi, everybody. My name is uh, Lisette May, and as Suchis uh, was saying, I work for the Land Portal Foundation. I'm the information management officer there. Uh, thank you for the opportunity for this webinar to you, to CTA, and to, to Godan. And thanks to everybody that tuned in and signed up for, for the webinar. I'm really happy uh, to be able to talk to you today about data interoperability and our experience at the LAM portal with um, open data management. Um, some of you, uh, as Suchin already announced, may have heard about the LAM portal already through the webinar my colleague Laura Mejolaro hosted a few weeks back about open land data and the controversy around opening up land data. Um, if you haven't seen it already, I definitely recommend you go see the recording of it because it raised a lot of great and important questions about open land data and the difficulties and challenges of making such sensitive data open, uh, but also the immense benefit of when it is open. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, the LAMP Portal website, um, our main product, and our experience with open data in that respect, um, and how we've experienced challenges and successes with aggregating open data on land through our website. Um, so the LAMP Portal website can be accessed through lampportal.org. Um, it's a free online resource that aims to give and increase access to data and information that relates to land and uh, land governance. Um, we recognize that data and information about land governance can be really hard to find. There are very there are a lot of institutions and people working on this issue, either as part of a broader context in agriculture or urbanization, or are working on a, a narrow aspect of it or focusing on gender issues and addressing land rights that way. And they all are producing in data and information and they all have knowledge products to share. But you really need to know who is doing what to be able to access everything. So that's why we have the Land Portal website, um, which can be used as a tool to guide people to these different um, sources of information and data um, and to see who is doing what, basically, when it comes to land governance. In that regard, we really do, don't intend to duplicate efforts or like, steal people's um, website hits, but we really want to serve as a gateway, a portal directing people to the data points um, across the World Wide Web. And in doing that, aggregating data and information, we often get the question, what does LAM portal uh, do better than Google? Uh, because I'll use Google to find everything that's dispersed across the web. Um, well, the difference is, is that uh, on Google, the search results rank you know, based on the number of hits a website gets and very complicated algorithms. Um, you can also pay Google to get higher up on search results. Um, but basically, grassroots knowledge, especially local NGOs and, and the data they collect, that's often not as visible as, say, data from the World Bank or the Food and Agriculture Organization. 
So that's what the LAN portal tries to do is put them on the same level. So we'll have a World Bank data set on land data, but we'll put the grassroots NGO report next to it or a perspective from somebody for, uh, working on a local level. So we give the user the same perspective. Another question we often get asked is about data quality and data reliability. People ask um, with such a controversial con uh, uh, subject as land and so many difference, differences of opinion and so many conflicts and disputes that are around land, how can I know that the data on land portal is reliable and, and of high enough quality for me to use? And that's a very difficult question and we realize that everybody has a different interpretation of what data quality means and what reliable data means. So we try to approach that as neutral as we can and um, we simply believe that for us there is no true or false data. We see every data set, every indicator, every publication, um, every knowledge product as an interpretation by an individual or a group at a certain place in time um, and all we can do as an aggregator is give the user as much information about the indicator, the, the knowledge product uh, or the data set that they can determine for them whether this is um, a valuable, of, of high enough quality and reliable enough for them. So basically we, enri we enrich it with, with metadata and I'll get into that in more detail later but that's really our stance to just give all the information a user needs about the source, about the date, so they so they can determine whether it's it's reliable for them to use. Now, ultimately, why do we do all this? Why do we focus on on data and uh, information and increasing that access in the land governance sector? Is that we ultimately believe that if we increase access to information about land and land governance, this ultimately leads to um, improved land governance and secure land rights for people because we believe that if data is more discoverable um, and more available and easy to use in the overall ecosystem it's more likely to be used and reused by others for the purposes we're all working towards is to secure um, people's land rights um, especially in the global south ultimately we believe that data is a value when it is delivered into the hands of the right people in the right context and Data, as everybody knows, is of a different value in a different context. Um, the data we collaboratively collect every day, is, it's, it differs per person and their expertise, how it can be used. Raw data, such as satellite images, the millions of images that get taken every day, mean, might probably mean very little to a local farmer when they have such great data, but it should be analyzed and digested by specialists and they can draw conclusions from it like land cover changes or even identify community settlements over time. And advocacy institutions need data in the form of powerful and gripping stories to uh, raise the uh, issue on the political agenda. And sometimes data should reach farmers and slum dwellers so they have the right information to empower themselves against outside threats um, and, and, and uh, against uh, land grabbing or other elements like that. And this environment where everybody is dealing with data, everybody recognizes their own expertise and builds on and adds to the data and makes sure that it reaches those right people and the right context is, is what we're trying to promote. And that's what we call um, the information ecosystem. And the information ecosystem is a term derived from the open data sector. I'm sure it's been mentioned many times in the webinars already. Um, but to us, the information ecosystem really relies on four general pillars. The first obviously being data and information. Um, that is the information that should reach the right people and the right context. Um, it all begins with data and information. And of course, people. Um, people that have their own expertise and their own unique role to play. As I was saying, um, different uh, types of data require different specialities. So we imagine that everybody has their own unique role to play. Each, everybody can add something to the data and work um, to move it to different people and to different contexts. Um, and, and we try to create awareness that everybody acts when they act around data that they're aware of their position in this overall ecosystem and what they can contribute and to whom um, the information should flow and how they can use it. 
um, the ecosystem is also very much about a certain attitude when it comes to data. It's an attitude about collaboration. Collaboration is necessary across sectors, across countries, to avoid duplication of efforts. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. We don't have to collect data that's already been collected. Um, and we should work as efficiently as possible and build uh, and collaborate um, on existing things rather than, than starting from scratch. It's also an attitude about wanting to learn from information. So, for example, when you've, we see it a lot when, when there is a research project that ended, they have the publication, they disseminate it, they have the visibility, the branding, and then it stops. Um, we try to promote that within the ecosystem. It should really only just start there. It should be the start of the conversation. It should be the start of really wanting to learn from information, taking a moment and really thinking, what does this data mean? Um, the publication quota in the academia sector um, has a very real risk that researchers really barely cr scratch the surface of their data before moving on to their next publication. So it's really about an attitude of, of learning and just taking the time to think about what does data mean and how can it be useful um, for other people. And in extension of that, it's also about an attitude of giving feedback. So when we're using data from a different source, we should give feedback to the data collector or the data publisher, how this was of use to them. Um, what can be done better? Should you maybe uh, include something else? Just to continuously improve the quality of the data and to just always you know, have that feedback, that conversation loop. Um, that attitude should be embedded in the ecosystem to make sure that the data can be as high quality as it can possibly be and, and be of most value um, for it to be reused and actually impact change. And then lastly, uh, the fourth pillar is about the infrastructure. Obviously, we talked about information people contexts. The infrastructure is basically needed for that information to flow from certain people to different contexts. It's the same as in a city. You need the infrastructure to move around from one place to another. And that infrastructure is necessary for information and data to flow within the ecosystem. And this infrastructure is something that I want to um, zoom in a little bit more on uh, during my presentation um, and basically what um, is the best infrastructure for the most automated way of this information to flow and also what is our experience as a LAM portal when we work on this infrastructure issue as a data aggregator we're trying to get information or metadata from certain platforms how what are the constraints and what are the the conditions in which that information flows best from one platform to another. Um, the level of automation in which um, the data flows from one platform or from one system to another is what we call data interoperability. The more interoperable the data is, the more automated the data flow is. Um, and I want to take you through like a few simple elements of that, what data interoperability really means. Um, the first thing is, of course, what data is flowing. For the LAMP portal, we talk about metadata only. Um, we host metadata, so information about uh, the data, so title, description, date of publication, publisher, all those kinds of uh, fields. Um, and, and with our library, public, uh, library repository, we focus only on that metadata. So that is the data that we exchange um, between platforms and that people can also harvest from our platform directly. Um, the set of fields um, that we fill in about a particular data set or resource is what we call the metadata model. Um, and the LAMP portal uses the Dublin Core um, standard model uh, for metadata. The level of automation in which the, the metadata can flow from one platform to another is heavily dependent on the format in which the metadata is published. Um, ideally, for it to be very automatic, you need a machine-readable format, namely that a computer does not need any sort of software to be able to read what the, med what the data is about. So machine-readable formats are CSV, XML, JSON, or RDF. The LAM portal uses uh, the latter, RDF. Um, what, what is less preferred is HTML, Excel, or PDF. Um, as you all know, for Excel, we need Microsoft Excel to be able to open the document. Uh, PDF, you need Acrobat Reader or Adobe, um, Adobe Reader or um, Apple Preview to open it. You need some sort of software in between. And for the information flow to go as automatic as possible, we don't want any software in between. So ideally, 
you'll have one of those machine readable formats. Then of course, an important question is where do you get that data? So we're talking about information flow between platforms and I've identified a platform that has very interesting publications that we want to link to from the LAMP portal. So where do we get that data? I have the website and how do I make sure that there's an automated automated data flow. Um, the most automatic way to do it is to have some sort of protocol, an access point, to call it simply, that hosts the metadata. Um, basically, as you can see from the image, it's a place where you can basically plug in, uh, so to speak, and the data flows through that automatically from one platform to the other. And such an access point can be an API, a Sparkle endpoint, that's the one the LAMP portal uses. Uh, for bibliographic repositories, you often see OAI PMH, that's a, a, also a standard protocol. But that is basically that access point where you can plug in and have the information flow automatically. You can do that periodically, say that you do that every night, so every morning you have the latest data on your platform. You can do it weekly, depends on how often the source update, updates their data, but that can be an automated flow. Um, our experience is that very little information providers, especially on a local level, have such an access point, such a protocol in place. So we always need to um, kind of look and find an ad hoc solution for this particular source to get the metadata that we need. Um, and that's often less sustainable. Um, one of the options is an export data. You know, when you go to a search um, engine or, or the search page of a repository that you're looking at, you often can fill in your query and you get the results and then it gives you an export data in so-and-so format option. Um, that's something we often do. So then we export the data in, in a particular format, but then it goes through our personal computer and then we upload it to the repository. So there's always a human um, action in between for that data to flow. So you can imagine that that's less sustainable. You always have to go back to see if they have new, new data. Um, other options are if they don't have an export data option, which is also a lot of the time that's the case. We've resorted to screen scraping, which is really not ideal. It's just brutally going to the HTML code and trying to extract the metadata that we can find in the website. Uh, that requires a lot of cleaning up. It's, it's very uh, HR intensive, so that's definitely not recommended. Sometimes it's even faster just to go copy paste and manually add it one by one to our repository. But um, this access point, as I said, is the most automatic way to do it and let that information flow. Now the next step is then we have the data from the source website, but how do we integrate it automatically into our website? And that often requires some data curation. If the source website has um, a standard metadata model that is easily matchable with ours and they use standards and, and all of that stuff, then we won't need any data curation. We can just the, the flow of uh, information goes right from the access point right into our repository. That is basically never the case for us. We always have to do some data curation and you'll see a picture here that's an internal file, how we do it. We have the partner field right on the left and then we just go through with notes um, and match it to our personal, our, our own uh, metadata model. We always have to restructure to make sure that it, and you know, the inputs from the field, uh, metadata field A from the partner gets into the right one. And I have um, an example here. Uh, so you'll see repository A is our source file here and we can match it. it. It's basically such a simple exercise. You just go, okay, that's that, that's that, that matches. Um, and you fill in your own metadata model like that. But as you can see, they the source file has a general tags metadata field, which happens a lot more than you would think um, when you work in the open data sector. They'll put in countries, they'll put in topics, they'll put in resource types, um, and we don't know how to fill that in into our own metadata model. So we're dealing with a lot of information there that we're not sure how to place and correctly implement in our, in our website. You'll also see that we're missing some crucial information. Who's the author? Um, we can't, we don't know what the license is um, for this for for these documents that we're importing, the language and geographical and topical coverage we can't figure out. So this is basically 
a daily puzzle that we go through when we have a new source thing to just to match up and how can we fill up as much metadata fields as we want because as I mentioned that's really important to us for users to be able to determine um, if it's reliable data or not. So that's the puzzle then let's say you have that tags field and we have all these inputs there and we need to put that right into correctly into our model how do we interpret these values, the inputs of the different metadata fields. Um, humans can understand data a lot. Generally, you know, when you when it's human input, then usually a human can understand it better than a machine. A machine only reads in zeros and ones in principle, so it won't always understand what you put in. For example, um, if somebody has a geographical coverage uh, country name field, and they'll put in Laos, or somebody put in Lao, or Lao PDR, or Laos people. People's Democratic Republic. As humans, we can understand, okay, this is the same country we're talking about, but a computer reads only zeros and ones and sees all these different countries. So it's it's always a lot of cleanup on our end to make sure that that's, um, you know, that that matches up and that only one country is linked to it. A solution to that is a standard that helps a computer read it. So you can go for um, polygons or, or you know, uh, geographical coordinates. The LAM portal uses ISO 3 uh, standard codes, so it has three letter codes that are unique for each country, um, that all these labels, these different ways that you can name a country are connected to. So when you download metadata from the LAM portal, you'll get LAO, and you'll know that everything, the computer knows that it's all related to Laos. Similar issues um, appear with the date of publication. Um, we all know that in the US, people tend to say, put dates in month, month, date, date, uh, and the year format, whereas in Europe, we use it the other way around. We do date, date, month, month. Um, often on Twitter, in the Netherlands at least, we I, I tend to see people around November 9th saying, oh, am I the only considerate person who remembers the attacks uh, on the Twin Towers and everything, but obviously uh, that was September 11th. Um, this is a human mistake, but you can really understand that machines will definitely make that mistake, especially if it's not done consistently over one um, over one database, and that happens a lot. So the standard that we've all uh, universally agreed on is that for data and metadata, we'll put in date, date, month, month, and the year. But it does require a lot of cleanup, and it's you can imagine it's difficult to check um, to make sure that you get this right. So there are standards for that to make sure that that's more discoverable. But as you can imagine, that country names and date of publications are difficult, let alone topical keywords. Um, when we talk about land governance, we're talking about a controversial topic. We're talking about something that is debated on a global level, but is extremely local as well. So it's debated in many natural languages, many dialects, uh, and, and just a lot of different ways of naming the same thing. So that harms the flow of information or being to able to interpret the topical coverage of in data and information um, that harms it a lot. So um, in the context of go to action, the LAM portal and the partners have done um, a review of the, the way people topically classify bibliographic land data, so publications and things. Um, you can see it on the map of standards uh, in the link on the, on, the, on the screen. But what we found is that there's absolutely no uniformity when it comes to classifying land data. Um, as I said in the beginning, everybody has their own angle to land data when they're working on it. So everybody uses a different way to classify it. And it is, it, it, really harms the flow of information because computers can't make those links that, you know, these things are, these are similar things, or this is a translation of that, or this is a synonym. So what we also try to um, do with a LAM portal is promote the use of topical standards. And um, there is a topical standard for land data, and that's called LANVOC. Um, LANVOC is not an independent thing. It's within FAO's uh, Agriculture Thesaurus, uh, Agrivoc, um, and there are about 270 land terms in there that we've been enriching as an Agrivoc editor over the years. Um, and the really powerful thing of that is that it assigns a machine-readable code to land-related concepts. 
Um, and that's really powerful because that machine readable code can hold so much information. It can hold definitions, one or more, because can we really say that we all can agree on a definition of a particular concept that relates to land data? It can hold translations into endless number of languages. It can be it can contain synonyms and translations of synonyms. Um, there can be relationships between terms. Um, so this influences that one or is, you know, further related to that one. It can do scope notes. Um, and, and all this information is all encompassed in that one machine readable code. So it's incredibly powerful. And I'll illustrate that with, with an example. And I usually do this from the publisher um, point of view. Um, and then I'll go into how that relates between interoperability between uh, repositories. But let's say I upload, I have a publication and I upload it to a database and I tag it with slums. If I upload that to a database that doesn't have a topical standard um, applied, a user querying that um, database with informal settlements or campoons will not get my slums publication uh, returned in their um, in their results, even though we as humans understand that my slums publication will probably be of interest to this user. If you do that in a, in a database that has this topical standard installed, the computer will associate it with a machine readable code. And that doesn't have to be, it, it, the user or me as an uploader never has to see the code. It exists in the back end of the database but the computer will associate it with that code. And once the user queries with informal settlements, favela, ghetto, townships, they will get this slums publication returned. So that really increases the discoverability of information. And that also happens between repositories. So um, you can make sure, understand that campoons and slums are the same between different uh, repositories. The code can also not only hold relationships between different concepts within the same vocabulary, but it can also hold relationships with vocabularies and thesauri outside. So for example, um, this code in Agrivoc is the same as code XX in Eurovoc or Hurodox. And you can imagine how incredibly powerful it can be if computers can connect to all these different databases that use these different standard vocabularies and understand that this is this is of the same topic and this is of interest and this ecosystem and the discoverability of information is so much more enriched it bridges culture it bridges language barriers it's extremely extremely powerful and important so just to summarize quickly the aspects of interoperability that are important so first the data that needs to be exchanged um, as i said lamp portal with bibliographic data exchanges metadata and the format is decisive in how automated the flow of information goes between platforms. Where do you get the data? Um, ideally we'll have an API or some other sort of ex access point to make sure that the data flows automatically. How do we ingest data? Do we need cu data curation and mapping? Standard metadata models really really help with that automated flow of information. And to interpret the data, we need to make use of standards to make sure that that flows um, flawlessly as well. Now quickly, now we know the, the conditions in which the data exchange and data flow goes most automatically. And I just quickly wanna share um, the LAMP portals experience in that and the struggles and the successes we've had in that. So the LAMP portal repository, and I'm talking about the library only about the bibliographic information holds, currently holds um, 84, uh, 48, apologies, 48,000 publications from over 1,200 different publishers. From that, um, there were 25, and that may have been updated in the last couple of weeks, maybe we're up to 27 now, but around that number, 25 automated data exchanges. And not one of them was 100% automatic. There was always a human layer in between, and more often than not, that was very labor intensive uh, than just a few tweaks here and there. Um, just to show, demonstrate a few of the data exchange uh, challenges that we've seen. Um, we very rarely see functional, functional interoperability, which is a different way of saying having that access point in, in, a, in, a, in a repository, um, especially with grassroots and local information providers 
there is no way to access the information. So we always need to resort to ad hoc solutions to get the information, either with an export or a screen scrape or just adding manually. Um, but we very rarely see that, only with really big um, information providers, such as the World Bank and FAO and stuff like that. Um, once we get the data, um, we often deal with either no metadata at all or very, very poor. Um, and as I indicated, that is a very important element for the LAMP portal. We want our users to be, have that metadata to be able to see what they um, what they can do, if they can do anything with that data, because if it's reliable or of high enough quality. So we try to enrich everything that is missing, and that takes a lot of time to make sure that at least you know when it was published or you know who the source is, um, and, and to enrich that, that process. Um, so that's very, yeah, very poor metadata from the source. Another issue that we see is that there are extremely few repositories that use standard classification systems. I've indicated before, um, we did, with Code on Action, we did this review of information providers with bibliographic uh, information on land, and extremely few repositories use a standard classification system. So it's always a puzzle for us to match that against um, Agrivoc a standard vocabulary. So it takes a lot of time to say that's an exact match, that's the broad match, and to make sure that um, it, it comes into our system according to a standard classification system. Now all the mappings we do, we, we do uh, publish on GitHub, so if anybody else ever wants, you know, to harvest from that source, they can at least see those mappings against a standard vocabulary as Agrivoc, Landvoc, um, and they can reuse it, um, so it's it's available for them. But yeah, it's it's very very labor intensive. Um, another aspect, another challenge that we see is that we pay extra attention to the provenance of the source. We think it's really important that a user should be able to know who is behind the particular piece of data or particular information. Not everybody trusts the World Bank as much, for example. So those are things that um, we're definitely we pay extra attention to. So what we do is we create a profile of each an individual um, uh, publisher. So if you go to our community section on the LAM portal, you'll find I think over 1800 profiles of publishers that have published or organizations that work on anything related to land governance. Each of our 1,200 publishers is profiled. You'll find a description, you'll find the title, you'll find the logo, you'll find contact information if it's there in public. Um, you, you'll be able to access their website. So just you can get a feel of the organization, the publisher um, behind this piece of information that you're looking at. Obviously, that creates, that is a lot of extra work on our part, but it's just the extra service we want to provide our users. Um, but that's very labor intensive. And it's also a lot of cleaning up from the source data. So, for example, we've harvested from the open knowledge repository from the World Bank. And even the World Bank, obviously they host a lot of their own materials, but even then we really had to clean up the information we got from there because they call themselves the World Bank, World Bank, the World Bank Group, World Bank Group, WB, and, and all kinds of combinations that we had to clean up and make sure that that was all linked to the same World Bank profile. So that's a lot of cleaning up that we do. Um, and it, 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 I can't count the number of times that I've had to, that I've found a publisher in the source metadata field that is simply an acronym and that I'm Googling and for the life of me cannot retrace which organization is behind this acronym. And that's the metadata that people have on their websites. And it's so important to be able to know who's behind it. For open data to work, for this information ecosystem to work, to be able to know which data you want to build on and which you don't. And people don't realize that an acronym that they use daily maybe or weekly or very regularly and makes you know is a second nature than them is in a in a different context really is not um so those are challenges that we definitely come come across and we try to overcome and try to enrich in in our own repository and of course an, another aspect is that as an aggregator with that gateway function that i mentioned that we in principle don't host the materials themselves and we can if people don't have their own platforms but in principle we don't we only link back to different websites of course we link back to websites with varying sustainability 
um, sometimes a project ends, funding ends, and the website moves or something, um, and, and the link just simply doesn't work. So that's something that we're not completely sure how to um, address, but it's an issue. Uh, and we always keep the metadata because we do feel that that's uh, a value to people, even if the full resource is not there. But we do try to figure out how can we make sure that this information does not get, get lost in, in the World Wide Web. Um, so yeah, these are a few challenges that we've experienced and hopefully illustrate the practical importance of these open data principles. It's not just because it looks nice and it, it's nicely structured, but it's actually really important um, for that flow of information to be able to happen, for that information and data to reach the context that you need and reaches it that context in a way that people have the essentials that they need um, to use and build on that data. Um, well, with these issues, Obviously, we don't only um, aggregate that information, but we see these issues and we want to address them. Um, and we're very, we're trying to be very frank about that and open up conversations because we see that especially local information providers at the grassroots level that have very important knowledge to share have these difficulties and, and their information does not flow and is not as prominent in the ecosystem as other um, more powerful actors are. So we're just trying to explore how can we be useful and how we see these issues and how can we help you um, make sure that your information is more visible. We've explored several options such as offering our own infrastructure, you know, you can upload anything to the LAMP portal as a user. We can also give you a section with your own branding if you want to. But of course that's not the most sustainable option. We're working towards this linked web, this ecosystem, and ideally we're connected to everything and everybody's connected to everybody in this distributed system and it shouldn't necessarily all have to be in one place. Um, we do information management capacity building um, and information and data management. Um, we do that also together with the Golden Action Consortium, you know, teaching these or building the capacities for these um, basic things such as metadata, such as standards, how to use it, how to publish to make sure that your information is more visible. We also do technical capacity building. Um, our, my colleague Carlos Tejo, our data officer, has worked together with IT staff from local information providers, helping them getting an API or some sort of access point um, installed and make sure that it works well on their own platform. Um, we've explored more options. You know, can we provide more technical services, what we're we've been discussing is can we maybe provide a skeleton with a standard metadata model, an access point, and these standards pre-installed that, that local information providers can just upload their information on. All these things are things that we're thinking about um, and, and just, you know, want to create a frank conversation of how can we make this information more accessible and, and be of help, basically. So if anybody, you know, that's listening um, has any ideas, we're always open to hear to hearing um, suggestions on that. Um, one other thing for the capacity building is that we're doing is that we've been working together with the Godan Action uh, Consortium to uh, customize their MOOC for open data management in agriculture, nutrition, and land. Um, registration is open already through the link um, on the slide. Uh, the, the course is three weeks long. It starts um, on October 1st. So if you have land information data, information knowledge products, and you want to share that and make sure that it's more visible in this ecosystem, uh, please register. Um, we're, well, yeah, as I said, we start in uh, October 1st, um, and we definitely hope to see you there uh, and help you make sure that we get more and more perspectives on land data and more visible, because that's really important. Um, that's basically all I, I uh, had to say. Um, I hope I've been able to illustrate the struggles of <laughs> trying to get that automated uh, flow of information going and, and to establish this information ecosystem uh, in a technical way. Um, yeah, and, and I hope I hope that it showed the importance of these open data principles and, and how to publish your data and how big a difference that makes in making sure that it reaches the right context in the right people to make sure it impacts that change that we're all collectively uh, working towards. So thank you so much. And I don't know if there are any questions, but be happy to answer them if there are. Thank you very much, Lisette. Thank you. This was a very informative uh, webinar and thank you for sharing your experiences uh, in this aspect. I'm sure 
uh, there are many questions already coming in, so oh, uh, we, can, we can go through the questions if you may. And I request uh, uh, all the participants, you know, if you have questions, you know, please send it through the chat window and we will answer answer them one by one. So first is uh, Olivia Muzza, who is, who is asking, uh, maybe this will come later in the presentation, but I am genuinely worried about how most data sets are not gendered, i.e. it is not of, uh, not, it's often not identifiable. What are the project impacts per gender group? How can this be improved in the future? Yeah, the gender disaggregation is something that, um, thank you, Olivia, for your question. Uh, gender disaggregated data is something that we get a lot of questions about, uh, indeed. Um, as I said, we're an aggregator, so we can only really aggregate the data that is out there. Um, but what we do try to do is, through our gender land page, show that there is this lack, that there is definitely a gap there, um, and that it should be addressed. Um, and all we can do is really raise awareness that uh, this should definitely um, be a point of attention and that make, make sure that when you collect data that you get disaggregated by gender, definitely. Thank you, Lisette. Uh, our next question is from uh, from uh, George, George Chira, who is asking, you first talk about data, now about information. Does, uh, does you, are you using it as one concept? That's a very good question. <laughs> um, I use it interchangeably, that's true. I also use knowledge interchangeably. The, the LAMP portal ingests raw data, so actual numbers, um, the actual raw data. We ingest information products, so, um, you know, publications, uh, infographics, all maps, all that kind of stuff that people did something with the data mm -hmm. uh, and built on it. Um, so it can be used by different audiences, because if we only use raw data, our um, experience is that um, some people, you know, it, it, it's of use for different audiences and we want to serve as broad as audience uh, as we can. But if, if you go to the LAMP portal, you'll see that you'll have a data section. So there you'll have the actual raw data. We have over 600 indicators, statistical indicators that relate to land. Our library has publications and, and more like knowledge products. Um, but we talk about open data, open information, and open knowledge interchangeably because we feel yeah. that all three are um, of value uh, to different people. Thank you very much. Um, so the next question is from uh, Chris Baker, who is asking, how do you know what you need is accessible in a Sparkle endpoint? Oh, okay. Uh, thanks for your question. Well, you're touching on something that um, is more my colleagues uh, Carlos's expertise than it is mine. Um, for the Sparkle endpoint, you need to put in a query. Um, so on the LAMP portal, I'm I'm not really sure where exactly you can access it, but you can access our Sparkle endpoint. I think it's lampportal.org/sparkle if I'm not mistaken. And there you can enter a query. So you can enter a query either for a country or a topic, and then it will return um, the, the data to you in RDF, uh, in an RDF file. And you can also for, um, if you don't wanna do it through a Sparkle endpoint, you can do it through our data set portfolios where you can download um, a specific data set. Um, and for other source, uh, other than the LAMP portal, it, yeah, Sparkle endpoint is usually through that sort of query, um, same with an API. Um, but my experience is, and I'm, I don't have a technical background as, as Suchi uh, introduced, I'm a lawyer. So for me, it's, it's always kind of abracadabra how my colleague Carlos <laughs> gets the data from a source file. Um, and I do see more and more um, of these access points being more user friendly, uh, that they have some sort of platform around it that you can access it. But that would definitely be my, you know, if, if I would be talking to technical people, make that human understandable, that you can access that uh, more easily without having to know query language or, or things like that. I hope that answers your question. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. And obviously, you know, if people have more questions or, you know, more details, you know, please email uh, Lisette. The, you can see her email and she'll be more than happy to connect you to the right people for more. Definitely. Uh, yeah. you know, so, you know, so Chris, if you if you want more details, you know, send an email and, uh, you know, Lisette will uh, uh, you'll make sure your full details, uh, full answers will be provided to you. So the next question is from a CC4 who is asking, what is the land portal doing to improve the quality and existence of metadata 
from the sources to ensure accuracy? Well, um, as I, it really depends on what uh, the source gives us. Um, often we miss uh, the publisher. So we try to find out um, who the publisher is. Either You can usually find it out through accessing the actual resource and, and seeing the logo on the publication. Um, but also things that are often missing are um, country names or topical keywords. And my colleague Carlos, who I mentioned, he's, he's really, he basically writes programs to get that information because it's usually in a description or a title and try to extract it that way to make sure that that information is enriched um, and tries to get it that way. Um, for licenses specifically, it's always very difficult. Um, in principle, the rule is if there is no license indicated, that means that it's all rights reserved. Mm -hmm. um, so then we put in all rights reserved, but we also have put in the practice to not put in any license just because um yeah we're not sure people have not uh, indicated that and we always email back to our source saying okay this is what we found these are the issues carlos always puts it down you know this this are the these are the issues that we found these are duplicate files in your system um and and gives them back as as tips you know as feedback um that's how you can enrich your metadata and license is always one of those fields that we have to provide feedback on. Thank you. Um, and the next question is also from a C4, a C4 who is asking, how do they plan to bridge the gap between people from the deep rural areas and ensuring that they have metadata able to process it and continually update it? Well, that's that's a really good question. And, and it's, it's something that we've been considering, you know, in this whole ecosystem as a global aggregator, what is our role and who is our audience that we're supposed to serve? Um, and it's also something that we try to promote, right? That everybody's very aware of their specific position within the ecosystem, their role and whom are you working for directly and, and who benefits um, from your work. So that said, we feel that as a global aggregator, and we don't go more local with our data than on the national level, we're actually exploring now um, how we can go deeper subnational level, but at the moment we don't. So probably for the deeper rural areas, the information on the LAM portal is not as relevant for them because it will be about the entire nation that they uh, live in. Um, so probably it's not of, uh, as valuable for them as mm -hmm. as more local platforms could be, um, but we do try to raise you know awareness about people being knowing who their uh, users are and who they are reaching out to and who which context and people their data and information can reach and and you know their repackaging of information. So we do try to work with local partners to see you know how can you make sure that you reach the rural areas and with the rural areas also often the the issue is that they don't have access to internet so a portal like the land portal would not be um the the platform that they'd be looking for um you would want to you reach them through other other means um so that are things that these people are probably better placed to explore than than we are at a global level um that said we do from our visitors, we get about 30,000 visitors a month, um, mm -hmm. of which 70% is from the Global South. So that was a surprise to us that even though we're mostly Northern based and working on a global level, that still a lot of people from the Global South come and visit the platform. But I doubt it's from those remote rural areas. Yeah. I hope Thank that answers you. your question. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Lisette. Uh, that's, uh, that's very useful. Uh, now, another question from Jur. The uh, question of Jude Globonik is on regarding data standards. Are there any tendencies of different stakeholders to agree on a data standard in agriculture? Um, well, there are always attempts to standardize. Um, I think my personal experience is that that in agriculture that's much more uh, progressed than it is in the land sector. Uh -huh. um, of course, with GACs and uh, AgriVoc and uh, NAL, the National Agricultural Library, and uh, CABI is the third with GACs, they have been really trying to, at least for the thesaurus and, and the vocabulary, trying to harmonize and standardize what they've been doing. For the land sector, 
a, it, it just, it, for some reason, it doesn't seem to be uh, up till now the priority. Um, it becomes more of a, a thing that people are thinking about standardizing, but often my, and, and that's also something we found when we when we're doing the goal and action work and mapping the standards that are used, not only for bibliographic classifications, but also beyond, is that for some reason, everybody seems to think that they are doing something with a slightly different angle or with a slightly different focus that warrants the creation of a new standard. Um, and it's very hard to convince people to say, well, please, let's go back and see what's already there and build on that, maybe enrich it a little um, and work together so that it's also also useful for your initiative. But uh, yeah, it's, for some reason, everybody thinks that, you know, they need to have their own standard, whether that's an issue with branding that people want to have their, their organization name associated to it, or they honestly believe that, you know, uh, technically it, it won't work with the other standard or it's not good enough. I won't be able to tell you, but um, yeah, we're trying to promote that people look at existing standards and, you know, build on, you know, that that's that attitude in the ecosystem that I was talking about, collaborate and build on rather than reinventing the wheel. Because yeah. with everybody establishing their own standard in the end, the situation you have is that there is no standard because everybody has their own. So it's a good question, but I think the agriculture sector is, is, is much more ahead than the land sector uh, on that. Thank you. Uh, so the next question is from Nam Sat, who is asking, uh, how do you deal with, you know, working, links not working since you are not hosting materials? So are you are your sources authoritative enough to rely on? Sorry, could you repeat that last part? Yeah, I didn't... So for example, you know, when you are when you have, uh, you know, links which are not working because you are not yourself hosting the materials, you are just providing the yeah. link to the material. So what will happen if those links are not working? Are, uh, are you sure that those sources are authoritative enough to rely on? Well, I think that question has two parts to it. So if, if the link goes down, we still have the metadata and we feel that the metadata is still um, really important to keep, even if the actual resource is not accessible anymore. Just so you know that it exists and you can see the, the source of the information, you can maybe go and contact them and get, you know, a paper version if, if the link doesn't work anymore. Mm -hmm. So we do monitor that if the links work or not, um, but we don't remove any links because we feel that the, the metadata is still very important. Mm -hmm. The rely, I don't think that necessarily has anything to do with the reliability or, or the check of, of the mm -hmm. source. Um, maybe it's an organization that merged with another one and doesn't exist anymore. We'll yeah. still create a profile for that. Um, and, and people can check, you know, what that organization used to do. But sometimes, you know, that happens over time. Projects and um, organizations merge or, or stop uh, when maybe they've fulfilled their mission or for whatever reason. Um, so we still feel that, you know, that's not a reason to remove the metadata of that resource, even if their data is not um, available. And we'll try to retrace as much as we can of that institution, even if it doesn't exist anymore, to create that profile for them. So that's definitely true from the 1,200 profiles um, you'll find on the LAMP portal for our publishers. There will be a portion of them that are not existing uh, organizations anymore. Okay. Thank you. Uh, because we have more questions coming in and we have okay. uh, just five minutes. I'm just going to go through a couple of them, a couple of questions. Uh, from this another one is from Adi Mosu who is asking, I would like to know if you have spectral data for agriculture purpose in Nigeria. Uh, what kind of data? Sorry. Spectral data. So, you know, it's like Spatial. remote sensing data. For agriculture. Um, well, as I said, we as for now, we only go up until national level. We don't go deeper, so we don't have geospatial um, data yet. There's yeah. actually a request for proposals out. Uh, you can find it on our website. So anybody that works in um, geospatial platforms or helps to develop them, please have a look because we're looking for proposals there because we yeah. do feel that it's some an important area to get into. Um, mm -hmm. and, and we've gotten that question more often. So that's definitely something we want to give our users and are exploring. But for now, we only have national level. Um, and for Nigeria, you can go to our website, uh, landportal.org, and go to countries in Nigeria. You can see all the information we have on Nigeria there. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 
Is it? Uh, so the next question is from uh, Sayed, uh, who is asking, could you provide the content list of the for the October 2018 course? Ah, okay. Um, yes. Well. Uh, I can I can list it to you right now. What we're going to do is uh, just a general introduction on open data. About it's going to be about managing open data. It's going to be about interoperability, as we discussed here, and intellectual property rights um, and licensing. So other than the previous courses, we're not going to get into the using part of it much as much. We're really going to focus on what the the content of this webinar is for a specific group that wants to share their data, make sure that it's part of the ecosystem, um, and I. Maybe we can email that later, Suchin, that we give some a little bit more information, uh, background information on the official website. I just have the sign up list uh, linked here because we uh, just opened up registration yesterday, so the official page wasn't ready yet. Um, but we can share that in email maybe later yeah. for people that, that are interested. Really useful. And I hope what, 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 because uh, for those of you who are not yet joined the Capacity Development Working Group of Godan, Please join uh, the uh, the working group. is free and open to everyone. So we will make sure the information on the course is uh, the links and everything will be sent through that uh, list as well. So once that is the, you know, you can make sure you get all the information needed as well. Thank you. And uh, we have another question uh, from Uludo Tun who is asking, who are the best people that need this open land data and or information? Wow. Um, well, that's a difficult question. Um, yeah. The best people, I, I, I wouldn't want to make a judgment on who is <laughs> which people yeah, are better yeah. to receive information uh, than others. But um, it depends on the data, because as I said, everybody, each different data has a different value in a different context, and everybody should build on it, and and you know repackage information that it's valuable to another type of user with their expertise. So I, I honestly, I. I couldn't give you one answer to that. It really depends on the person. But I think everybody can do something with data and can add something to data. Everybody has a perspective to share. Yeah. Thank you, Alisa. And uh, this is the last question. So because we are nearly ending the our webinar time, so let us focus uh, one more question. So this is from uh, Oching Oku, who is asking, how does my research organization contribute to data in land portal. Oh, that's a very interesting question. So someone wants to know if, if their research organization can they, uh, how do they contribute to land, land uh, to the land portal? Thank you. That's that's great. We're always looking for for more contributions and more data and to to find all the different uh, uh, sources um, and and link back to you. Um, you can email me personally with the email in, uh, on the screen. Um, you can also. Uh, go to the LAM portal and sign up. Then you can upload things yourself and contribute to debates and things like that. I mean, active user. Um, we also have a form there um, for if you have a lot of information that you can fill in um, about your data and, and things about your API. Do you have an API and things like that? So we can make that automation flow happening. But you can also uh, just email me directly and we can uh, discuss that through email. Great. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Lisset, uh, for your excellent presentation and also for answering these questions. You know, and being uh, very this was a very lively. And I want to thank all the participants also. You know, it was a really lively discussions and you uh, a lot of very interesting questions were asked. And this is the most important thing. So you, you know, there's a it's a two way uh, interactions to share ideas. So even though the uh, webinar we will be finishing the webinar now. You know, if you have any other questions, you know, feel free to email. Lisset, or also, you know, if you have questions, you can share with the uh, capacity development working group of uh, good and, you know, we can continue these discussions uh, later as well. So I want to thank all participants uh, who joined today's webinar and also we will make sure this uh, recording of this webinar is made available for those who are not able to participate. So it will be reaching a much wider audience later as well. So we want to thank uh, CTA and our colleagues in CTA, especially uh, Chris Addison and uh, Chipo amazingly who had who was who helped us make this webinar possible and providing all the uh, background support to make the webinar uh, hosting possible. So I want to thank CT and all, all colleagues there. And once again, I want to thank all of you who joined the webinar and for Lisset and the Land Portal Foundation who uh, presented uh, and shared their uh, ideas and experience with us. So thank you all, and I look thank forward to you. seeing you all for the next webinar. Bye for now. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.